Now, brothers and sisters, it's that time. I want you to get on your feet and put your hands together for the president and founder of the National Action Network, the Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton. No justice, no justice, no justice, no justice. What do we want? What do we want? What do we want? When do we want it? 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 Fist bump the person next to you, tell them you love them. Dr. William Jones, who brought me in the movement, he and Reverend Jackson, when I was 12. As time went on, his daughter, Jennifer Jones Austin, became very ill. And even here, we did a blood drive for her. Family did not know if we was going to lose Jenny. She talked about her mother this morning, and all of us prayed and did what we could, but somehow God brought her through. Little did, little did her mother, Natalie, and others know that not only would God spare her life, but God would put her in the forefront of changing the Constitution of the state of New York. If you don't give up in your weakest moment, if you don't lose faith when it seems like it's all against you, God got more for you than the present condition you're in. Just hold on and your change will come. No change. there would be a red wave and that all over the country that red wave was going to change the setup in this country they predicted that they would win overwhelmingly 30 40 50 seats in the house of representatives with a red wave they predicted that they'd have the senate but this morning they're still counting votes 
in Nevada. They've already lost Arizona. And they are on their way for a second run showdown in Georgia. I went up to MSNBC yesterday to be a guest on somebody else's show. And they asked me, they said, you never seem too concerned about the red wave. I said, well, you know, I come out of a religion that we don't get afraid at the banks of the Red Sea. If you believe in the Red Sea, you don't have to fear the red wave and your change will come. And network change choir give them a big hand give them a big hand certainly we're happy to be with you another Saturday morning for the Saturday action rally for you that are here live in the house of justice 145th street in the village of Harlem and for you that are listening live on 1190 WLIBAM in New York, and for you that are watching on our various platforms, wherever you are in the country, we are happy to join you in your homes and wherever you may be to give our report on where the action is. Give a hand to our presider, Attorney Michael Harding. Our musical director, brother, minister, Tyrone Richardson. And uh, of course, to our, uh, give me the, give him a drummer, Chris, and the guitar player, son. And uh, we're certainly glad to be uh, blessed this morning with a word uh, from our, my friend and brother down through the years. Uh, who gave us such a dynamic word, Reverend Dr. Frederick Crawford. And Reverend Crawford is one of our leading faith leaders in the state, and uh, we're honored to have him uh, in the house giving that word from Union Grove Baptist Church. We're also very happy to have had words from our vice chairman of the board of Nash Action Network, who uh, heads, of course, the, uh, the Protestant uh, welfare agencies in New York. But really, uh, I don't want you to underestimate the impact of passing that uh, this week, when people flipped the ballot and did what they had to do and made history in the state of New York and we absolutely are celebrating this as a first step. Give another hand to Jennifer Jones Austin. Now we are, uh, let me say this and, and I got a lot of ground to cover and I'm gonna to try to cover all of it. First of all, uh, let me say that I want to announce the passing of National Action Network member Margaret Lamb. 
and uh, Mother Lamb passed this week uh, 99 years old. And uh, she passed this week, and uh, she was a faithful member here to her family moved her to North Carolina, but she was here every Saturday. And she was in the house at the Audubon Ballroom in 1965 when Malcolm X was killed. And she said, just like she was there with Malcolm every Sunday, she was here every Saturday. In fact, when Mother Lamb made sure, she said, Red Mal, I know you come out the King Movement, but hang that picture of Malcolm up here. She brought me that picture <laughs> and made me put that picture up. And uh, they will be, we'll be funeralizing her uh, next uh, Sunday at 2 p.m. at the uh, First Bethel AME Church, 132nd Street, uh, uh, that's between, I believe, Lennox and Phil uh, at 2 o'clock. I want all the NAN members to be there for the funeral services of uh, Mother Lamb. Then on next Saturday, the 19th at uh, uh, 2 o'clock, we're going to Inglewood, New Jersey, where the Inglewood police killed this young brother, 22 years old, Bernard Plastic. Stand up. The family's here with us, been with us. And we want, we want many of us that can after the rally to come and, uh, and go with us to Inglewood. We're going to have a bus here to bring you there and back because we want to stand up for Bernard. Let that family know we're going to make K-pop in Inglewood, New Jersey to support them on next uh, Saturday. This is an action movement. We don't just protestpicate and proselytize, we are action. When Barack Obama spoke here once, he said that this is not the national procrastination movement, it's the national action movement. And that's what we do, and that's why we were all involved in getting the, uh, the racial justice. Let me tell you something we're gonna do with this legislation. One, we're gonna make sure it's enacted right. Because legislation on its own does not mean it is going to be enacted and enforced. You have to make the law and enforce the law and monitor the lawmakers. But we're going to be on that, and then we're going to bring it around the country. Jenny and uh, I have already talked about how we need to really deal with what cities and where we are going and how we get there and how we strategize. So we are certainly going to be on uh, that, and we're going to be diligent uh, in that effort. Uh, let me also say that uh, we are really keen on the fact that here in New York, with this whole battle of, of, of who was going to have the minds of the uh, public, one of the things that I think that we have allowed uh, those that are contrary to the interests of our community control the narrative of what was going on. If you watched a lot of the media and the commercials, you would think that every black in New York or Chicago or Atlanta or every major city were hoodlums and thugs and criminals. Now, there is a crime problem in some areas, and we need to address it. But every criminal is not black. And every black is not for protecting criminals. And the demonizing of it. They, they, they stopped me the other day, coming out of uh, 30 Rock. He said to me, well, what do you think about hip-hop and crime? First of all, hip-hop does not become synonymous with crime because a rapper got killed. It is wrong. Those that have criminal lyrics, we deal with that. Those that don't, there are many constructive, positive people in hip-hop. And, and it didn't start, in uh, entertainment didn't start getting violent with hip-hop. I remember R&B singers 
used to have shootouts. Country and Western singers have had violence. Don't try and stigmatize just one genre to fit your racial profile. And one of the things that I have resented is the way they have overreached and tried to, in many ways, uh, vilify and destroyed the image of the District Attorney of Manhattan. The District Attorney of Manhattan became the focal point of the Republican candidate for governor who went overboard. And I think that it is wrong. We can all make our points. We can all do what we feel is right. But to distort and outright race bait is wrong. And I'm glad that he is here with us this morning. I want him to give some words to District Attorney of Manhattan, the Honorable Alvin Bragg. Good morning, Nan family. Uh, before, before I talk about public safety and crime, I do have to salute my, my big sister here, Jennifer Jones Austin. Uh, and hopefully Reverend will give me a, just a moment to indulge me because this is how this works. He's mentored both of us. Uh, and so much of this is how you pass things on. Uh, and so when I went to vote on Tuesday, I of course flipped the ballot because we've been listening to Jennifer Jones Austin. But then that night, and I haven't had a chance to tell you this yet, I was talking with my daughter. Uh, and my daughter had been in touch with Jennifer last summer. Uh, and so just a, a brief interaction that Jennifer may not even recall was by text with my daughter, made an impression on her, planted a seed. And when I came home from voting, she said, oh, was that what that, that, that's what Jennifer was talking about, flip the ballot? Yes, that's exactly what it was. And that's planting that seed, which Reverend Sharpton has done with so many in our community and mentored so many of us and just so happy, happy to benefit it from Jennifer doing it to my daughter. So it's not just the work in all the community, it's person by person and child by child. So thank you. Uh, Reverend Sharpton said he was uh, on, on someone else's show, uh, and I, I, I had a chance to catch some of that, and I, I, I think he put it just right when he said, the extremists lost, right? The extremists lost. Uh, and he, he used the word this, this morning, just a little while ago, race baiting. Uh, I had an opportunity to see some of those commercials that the uh, uh, Republican gubernatorial candidate run. I think I was the only black face in some of those commercials. Isn't that something? Uh, so glory be to God that we have smart voters in this state, and I want to particularly salute the voters in Manhattan. Last year in November, I was elected district attorney by 84% of Manhattan voters. On Tuesday, by almost the same identical number, 82% of Manhattan voters rejected that race-baiting nonsense. <laughs> Reverend also said, we, we know we live here, we work here, we go to church here. We know we have problems to address, right? Real problems need real solutions, though, not race-baiting, partisan gibberish. Uh, so... We will continue to do the work, the work that we know we need from walking our streets, from sitting in our pews, from talking to our neighbors. Uh, I'm concerned about public safety for my kids and for your kids. Uh, so I'm so grateful to Reverend Sharpton to give me a couple of moments to talk about what we are doing. Um, uh, and I want to, as I always do, start with, with gun violence. Right? This has plagued our communities for some time. It's been a priority. Uh, so our gun prosecutions this year are up. Uh, we are focusing on the very, very small percentage of those among us who do the most harm. Uh, uh, and we're starting to see the results. Uh, citywide, shootings and homicides are down. Yeah, we can clap for that, definitely. And you, you might not know it uh, from what you read, but I'm here to tell you that they are down further in Manhattan. So we're going to keep on uh, doing those kind of prosecutions. We're going to keep on doing hate crimes, sex crimes, domestic violence, all the things that we need. Uh, we're going to keep on doing that and doing that in partnership with you.
But what we also are going to keep on doing is the work that we know we need the investments in our communities, yes, right? So we know we need to improve our mental health infrastructure. Yes, a lot of the things that people are talking about are coming out of this once in a hundred year pandemic and the dislocation. So we are investing in the district attorney's office, connecting people who need help, who need help to services like mental health and substance use disorder. We're doing that every single day. Uh, and we're going to keep doing it. We also have been talking about and actually using the law to help those amongst us who the law has been used against. What am I talking about? Workers and tenants. Uh, so we recently started a unit, a housing and tenant protection unit, uh, because we know affordable housing is at the root of a lot of this, right? And we want to be a part of the solution. We know we have unscrupulous landlords who are harassing tenants uh, out of their homes. Uh, we know that that's been causing some of the harm we see on, on our streets. So we started a unit about a month ago, and I'm proud to say we've already brought our first case against six developers who we allege have taken more than a million dollars in money that was supposed to go for affordable housing, but instead we're charging exorbitant rents to people like you and me. So we're going to keep on doing that work, and that's public safety work, standing up for the tenants and then for the workers who are not making the ways they're supposed to but being, being paid criminally low wages. That is public safety work. The mental health work is public safety work. People talk about recidivism. Yes, we're going to address that. We're worried about that. But we know if we get to the root issues and address people's real issues, then we won't keep on seeing this cycle that we've seen for decades. And as Reverend said, also, we see it all around the country. Uh, so I'm just here to say thank you. Uh, thank you to the 84% and the 82% that went to the polls. Uh, thank you to the community groups that we're partnering with every day, working on these investments in our community. Thank you to Reverend Sharpton. Thank you to Dan. Thank you to Nan Youth Huddle. All of this together is public safety work. That flipping the ballot is public safety work because we're not going to have public safety until we have equity and we're treated as one. So thank you so much and God bless you. Give my hand, Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. I like to see politicians when they're not running. <laughs> Let me say this around the country. The fact that the Democrats did not take the political beating that was expected does not mean we don't expect them now to stand up and fulfill what we need fulfilled. We must not compromise on the John Lewis voting rights bill. Maybe with the Republicans maybe not taking the Senate, we'll see at best they may tie. Maybe one or two of them will understand why they need to vote for that bill now. And we need to make sure every Democrat votes for that bill. President Biden was on my daily radio show last Monday and said they're going to reintroduce that bill. We're coming back with George Floyd. We do not want to see everybody having a victory party and then we win nothing but you getting in office and we not get the legislation out of that office. So I want the people around the country watching us on Impact Television welcome our Impact Television family. I want y'all working with our chapters and I want us working here. Now, as we organize on December 9th, which is about three Fridays from now, the uh, documentary that John Legend's group uh, have put together, have put out on, uh, uh, on my activist life from when I was a teenager under Bill Jones till now, called Loudmouth, is going to be in 30 cities in theaters uh, starting December 9th. I, I was teasing uh, some folk in the uh, office that usually civil rights leaders had to die to get in the theaters. You may get a documentary on TV, but in the theaters. And, uh, but we're going to use it as an organizing vehicle. In every city, we're going to have people in front of the theaters telling people you need to join National Action Network. 
I'm not an actor in the movies. This is about a life of activism, and we want to turn it into activism. It's going to be in two theaters in New York. We're going to sign people up here that'll be loudmouth activists. You know when, you know uh, D.A. Uh, 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 Bragg, when they came to me and said they wanted to name it loudmouth, I told them that unlike many before me, Jenny, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, which was part of New York City. I didn't come out of Atlanta like Dr. King or Greenville, like Reverend Jackson. All in those cities, you could put out a press release, have a rally, and you would get the attention of the city. Well, in New York, where I grew up, we had to compete against Times Square, Broadway plays, Statue of Liberty, Apollo Theater. You had to be loud to get attention in New York. You had five boroughs, and every borough had a different character, Rim Crawford. We had a minister's council in every borough. You had the Empire State, but then you had Brooklyn and Queens. So you had to cut up to get cut in in New York. So when they talk about loudmouth, yeah, I was loud. That's why we was heard. I don't apologize for being loud. I'm still loud. <clears throat> and I'm going to stay loud as long as there's something to be loud about. We're going to be loud in Inglewood next week. We got stuff to be loud about. Don't apologize. So we're going to make T-shirts and get tote bags saying, yes, I'm a loudmouth going to see Reverend Sharpton's loudmouth movie. Y'all that want to be loudmouths around the country, be in touch with us, www.nationalactionnetwork.net. You here that want to spend an hour or two with us, uh, sign at the counter, and we're going to rotate every two hours and give you stuff. But I wanted to use it as an organizing tool, and it's a, it's a good documentary. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, we have, we have reserved people, uh, but... Some of us got to dramatize this. Some of us have got to make sure we are not ignored. And that is part of what we have to do. Now, part of that also is the science. I spent some time always trying to break this down. Now, I huddle leaders. There's the science of organizing. Don't be loud to be just loud. Be loud with content. I keep, you know, I'll never forget that young brother that got all incited, Gwen Carr, in Ferguson years ago. And they were out there, were talking all this talk, this violent talk, while we were there trying to get justice for Michael Brown. And he went through a, a, a something in one of the stores, got caught on camera. They put him in jail, six years. None of the folks that was rallying him went back to see him. Same thing just happened in Louisville. There is a difference between uh, uh, anger performance and anger. I, I heard somebody call it angertainment. <laughs> angertainment, like entertainment. They ain't really angry. They trying to get up and be seen. You know, ain't, ain't angertainment rather than entertainment. Just burn the town down while you leave town. And then others got to pay the price for your angertainment. I heard somebody say that. I didn't create this slogan, but I'm going to take it and Ashley get it, we gonna have that hashtag by the end of the day. Tomorrow I'm gonna take credit for it, but today I'm gonna admit I heard it somewhere. <laughs> we strategically were loud. When they killed Michael Griffin, 30, over 30 years ago, our marches made them have to deal with a special prosecutor. But let me tell you the continuity movement. That's why the movie is important for you to see. From Howard Beach 
where we had to fight to get a special prosecutor to where today we can elect in Manhattan where Wall Street is and where the media and entertainment world is headquartered, we can elect a prosecutor. That is progress of a movement. And that's why people be talking about, well, I don't see where we're going, because you ain't involved in nothing. We are not where we need to be, but we're a whole lot further than we were. I remember uh, Dr. King, I was, he, we listened to one of his recordings, he talked about how he was uh, looked at a man in Alabama right after they got the Civil Rights Act passed in 64. And he said that uh, this man walked up and said, Dr. King, he said, yes, sir. He said, I see y'all's up there in the White House and got the Civil Rights Act passed. He said, now some of the young militants think it don't mean nothing. He said, but let me tell you something, Dr. King. I went downtown to where I used to not be able to use the bathroom. And I went to the white folks' bathroom because it ain't their bathroom no more. <laughs> and it might not mean nothing to the youngins. He, this is the man talking about the king. He said, but when you get my age and got to go to the bathroom, it mean a whole lot to you when you can go to any bathroom. <laughs> and he finished by saying, we ain't where we gonna be. We ain't where we ought to be, but we ain't where we was. And if we keep fighting, we will, right in Georgia, as, as, as embarrassing to me, I can't speak for nobody else up here. I can't be political. Michael Hardy be sending me funny emails. But for me, as embarrassing as Herschel Walker is, they never dreamed in the state of Georgia where Lester Maddox chased blacks out of his restaurant with an ax handle and became the governor of the state of Georgia. Now the fate of who will be in the U.S. Senate is between two black men. They never thought that would happen. They never thought we'd be able to vote in Georgia. Now we're going to be the senator again in Georgia if you keep on fighting your change will come. There are those that make a career out of condemning everybody that gets something done because their, their way of being known is condemn everything. But let me tell you something. It's like Jenny, it's like being in a football game. I learned from some of my mentors in Breadbasket that your father headed up here. One uh, uh, activist leader mentor to me said to me, Reverend Al, let me tell you something. I said, what? He said, being a effective leader and activist, I wasn't but about 13 or 14 at the time. He said, it's like playing football. He said, half of the stadium is going to cheer you, and Alvin, the other half is going to cheer you. He said, your job is not to get intoxicated by the cheers or depressed by the jeers. Your job is to keep your eye on the goal line and get the ball across the goal line and score. And if you are running and they come 300 pounds to tackle you, and criticize you and be unfair to you, then that must mean you the guy with the ball. Ain't nobody trying to tackle folk that ain't got the ball. Ain't nobody talking about who don't have the ball. But if everybody is talking about you, scandalizing you, and trying to trip you up, it must be you got the ball. Put the ball in high grip and run for the goal line. That's why everybody can't make the Hall of Fame. 
because you'd be too busy reacting to those in the stand. Folk to make the Hall of Fame score no matter how much they boo. Score no matter how much they scandalize you. And those that have brought us this far are the ones that kept their eye on the prize and kept scoring. That's all right, and I want you all to be part of that. Reverend Clay, stand up, Reverend Clay, my brother and friend from Los Angeles here at Southeast. Uh, uh, Reverend Mark, stand up, Reverend Marks. And, and uh, your wife, with you stand up, Reverend Marks and Ms. Marks from Los Angeles Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Red Marks, glad to have you. Y'all get some seats up in here and let Red Marks and Sister Red Marks come and sit up here. I don't need security sitting in seats. Y'all need to be standing up looking at folk mean. Y'all supposed to be gritting your teeth, make folk feel like you're going to do something up in here. Y'all sitting down enjoying the message. Get up and act mean to somebody. One of the things that we've got to deal with is now we must lay out an agenda, a national agenda, on where we go from here. We cannot keep organizing our folk, getting them to come out. They voted, as D.A. Bragg said, in big numbers. Young people voted in big numbers. Black men voted in big numbers. So now the question is, what we going to get for our vote? Let me tell you something. There's going to be a real challenge for y'all in New York. While they were demonizing Bragg and demonizing us, they changed the districts. And New York State lost four Democratic congressional seats. Four. I was reading the New York Times this morning that if the Democrats lose control of the Congress, it will be in large part to the state of New York. Let me tell you something now. They lost seats in this state. And how are we going to fight that? They, what, what were they, able to, they were able to do, they got a commission, some stacked by the governor, Cuomo, not uh, uh, Hochul. Then the courts, Court of Appeals upheld it. And they changed the lines. Even the head of the Democratic Congressional Committee lost his seat. Because you build movements and political engagement from the ground up, not from the top down. And one of the reasons Hochul and them won is they started getting on the ground because some of the folks started getting on them is that you got to get on the ground. That's why I don't care where I am. They're going to have my movie open with Hollywood next Friday, but I'll be here next Saturday. I know where movements don't come from Hollywood. It comes from the ground up. You can build a long, tall building, and if something happens to the penthouse of that building, that will affect 32-story building, penthouse gets hit by lightning. It will affect the top of the building. But if something hits the basement of the building, yes, the whole building is in trouble. You've got to build a foundation in order for it to be able to stand having equality. That's why the objective was to have what Jennifer Jones Austin and the campaign the city did that started under de Blasio, that we need to have the constitution 
of the state change. We need to study this so we're not guessing at what income is. And that's what I want all of us to support now. I'm going to call a, a meeting of our, of our black elected officials. There was a time we had co-ed and, and all of these gatherings. We don't even have our officials talking no more. We got more blacks in power in the state of New York than we ever had and less communication than they ever had. And I'm going to call a meeting. We need to, Crawford, get them all in the room. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And say, why can't we come together on crime? Why can't we come together on income equality? Why can't we come together on what's going on with gentrification? Why are people attacking one of y'all and the rest of y'all act like y'all don't know him? We need to protect our community and we need to stand together and stop this solo riding and stand one for all and all for one in the community. Everybody got their lane. One of the reasons why it's good that the so-called legacy civil rights groups, we've been working together for 10 years. Urban League, NACP, National Action Network, Legal Defense Fund, uh, a Black Women's Roundtable, Lawyers Committee, all of us, eight of us, got together when Obama got in and said, we're going to work together and we're going to try to have access to Obama's administration, push from the inside and keep the pressure on the outside. And everybody got a role. Our role, Nan's role was what we do, direct action, nonviolent movement, Reverend Mark, and that's what we did. We had all the big marches and still do in Washington and all of the protests. Urban League dealt with the corporate structure. NACP does what it does. If everybody stay in their lane, that's it. That's it. you don't have accidents. Where you have accidents is when a car jumps lanes and doesn't even give us a signal that I'm getting ready to turn. Because some of us out of ego want to be all things to all folk. Stay in your lane. Alvin been downtown as DA for, what, two years, a year? One year. I ain't been in his office yet because I ain't a DA or a prosecutor and don't want to be a defendant. <laughs> so I don't be going down there trying to act like, what, what about this case? What y'all do here? I ain't in that lane. Something happened to violate civil rights, then I'll go down and ask to talk to him. Some of y'all try to be everything. And can't be everybody to try to be everything end up being nothing. I don't try to deal with the legal stuff in there. Hardy does that. Hardy been to school, passed the bar. Understands that. That's his lane. Some of y'all coming in want to join the choir, can't sing. And, and, you know, Minister Richardson try to be nice, <laughs> let you move your lips, but don't sing. And I tell Richardson, he ain't being mean to you, it come from me. I said, they can stand up there and move their lips, but Tisha going to do the solos. Because Tisha can sing, you can just lip sing. Stay in your lane. We, let me tell you, he come out of SLC where I started in, in, in the chapter here in New York. How do we in the 60s, everybody romanticizes the 60s. How do we in the 60s have Dr. King in the South, Malcolm in the North, Thurgood Marshall in the courts, Adam Craig Powell in Congress, Fannie Lou Hame in Mississippi, all at the same time. And we get to the 21st century 
We got a hundred more cable stations they didn't have. Got all kind of access to radio and social media. And act like only one Negro can talk at a time. We got more to work with and get less done. You realize that that generation, Adam, Martin, Malcolm, Fannie Lou, Rosa Parks, they changed this whole country. That's why I so admired what Jennifer Jones Austin did. They changed this whole country and state laws with rotary phones and a Rexacraft machine. Here we got all these kind of ways to communicate. TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Got cell phones in your pocket. You ain't even got to wait till you get to a pay phone. Cell phone in your pocket. And we can't get five Negroes together to do nothing. Because you lost your will. And you too busy running around ego tripping and anger tainted and not organizing. There is no reason that the children of those that wrote national law in the 60s shouldn't at least be writing state law today. How do we measure the 60s? Civil Rights Act, 64. Voting Rights Act, 65. Open Housing Act, 68. We don't measure the 60s by who made the best speech standing on the ladder on 125th Street. And they had some great orators. I used to be mesmerized. But nobody remembers them unless they were part of getting those landmark things done. Just like yet everybody made a career out of jumping on Obama. I want to make Obama do this. We going to do this. Blah, 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 blah. Soon as Obama left and Trump got in, they same folk out there talking about he trying to take back everything Obama did. Well, I thought you said Obama didn't do nothing. And you created the atmosphere for Trump to come. Because you too busy trying to get on stage that you don't understand the stage you set it. Like right now, everybody now that flipping on Trump, talking about DeSantis has got the steam. And DeSantis is the new rising star on the right. And I, and I ain't saying nothing against him. I'm giving him enough room. When you see the folk against you fighting, give him room. I give water to DeSantis or Trump. Y'all fight it out. <laughs> but don't be deceived. DeSantis' policies is as bad as Trump. DeSantis is the one banning books that refers to civil rights in the Florida schools. DeSantis is the one that has come with some of the most archaic and backward law. Don't act like it's progress to go from Trump to DeSantis. Progress is when you get those in power that are accountable to us. And us means all of us. Let, let me tell you this other thing. God called me this week. I got to say this. God called me this week and said, well, Reverend Mario, you know, I understand all that about you talk about voting and all that, but I don't want to do nothing but get my reparations. I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, let me ask you a question. Who do you think going to pay you your reparations? He said, I want the government to pay. I said, well, if you don't vote for folk to be in the government that support reparations, then how you going to get them? If everybody in office is in office because you didn't vote and they against reparations, then who's going to pay you? Well, some things we need to do for ourselves. Okay, so let me get this right. I didn't go to the schools Hardy went through, so maybe it takes me a longer time to figure this out. 
we going to pay ourselves reparations? I mean, do you think about what you be saying? If you really want reparations, then you really want folk in Congress and in the Senate that will work with Sheila Jackson Lee to get the Commission on Reparations, because that is before the Congress right now, if that's what you really want. If you really want justice in policing, we got to put folk in the Senate and the Congress and in the state legislation that will legislate justice in policing. Gwen Carr, sitting here this morning, that got the Eric Gardner state law is against the law in the state for policemen to use a chokehold. She didn't get it. She didn't get it, and we didn't work with her by going to Albany and going in front of the legislators, calling them a bunch of MFers. She did it by when we had to march, we marched. When we had to meet, we met. Whatever we had to do, the objective was to get the law. You caught up, I keep telling you now, on this action, action, anger, uh, uh, anger, attainment. I told you by tomorrow to be all mine. <laughs> you want a profile. You want a profile rather than produce. That's why I, t I, t I told Ashley. Ashley is an expert in the family on social media. I told her about uh, two years ago to unfollow a lot of these folks. You know, because they had everybody that was in the, you know, anybody in, in Mississippi that said something, they had me follow them. I said, unfollow all these folks. I don't even want that in my mind. I'm out here marching and sweating and jumping up and down the airplanes. And you got, I'm the new God posing. Look at my right side. Oh, you missed my new pose. I said, get all this mess off my social media. These Negroes are not in, not in serious. You trying to be GQ when I'm trying to change laws. And we get caught off in this. Distraction. Fatal distractions. And if you study history, it's the serious people that made the change. That's why I love what Crawford did about Jeremiah. God told Jeremiah, go to the potter's house. You heard that this morning? Well, there's a reason for that. Because the potter takes the clay to create something. You need to go where something is being formed and made. And the part of first had it wrong, was print was in it. They had to make it again. You need to read that scripture he talked about. He sent the part of back. Because the part of indignant was in there. And they had to redo it, the potter's house. And the conclusion was just like the clay was in the potter's hand. We're in the hand of God. And the reason why I was not afraid of all that Trump and them put out during the midterm election is I'm in the Lord's hand. I wasn't scared of a red wave because just like the potter, I'm in the Lord's hand. That's why I didn't say we're going to lose it all. We didn't gain it all by ourselves. We're in the Lord's hand. And if the Lord be on our side, if God be on our side, who can be against us?
The old folk used to say it this way, if it hadn't been for the law, I didn't have no money. I didn't have no background. I didn't have no connections. But if it hadn't been for the Lord on our side, he brought us from a mighty long way from the outhouse to the White House. If it hadn't been the Lord on our side, where would I be? Where would I be? Where would I be? He's got the whole world in his hand. Just like the potter got the clay, he got the whole world in his hand. That's why I ain't scared of the right wing, because they in his hand. He got the whole wide world in his hand. He's got the whole world in his hand. He's got the whole world in his hand. Before we open the doors of the movement, I want us, in memory of our mother, Margaret Lamb, she loved the song Marvin Sapp sang. She told me, I love that song, and I want us to end the broadcast today honoring Mother Lamb, singing her song, Marvin Sapp's song. I never would have made it. She told me one day from Malcolm's rally to Nan's rally, I never would have made it. I never would have made it without you.